friends, if you could take your seats, we'll get underway. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the 19th annual fall conference of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. I'm Carter Sneed. I'm the director of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture, and I'm delighted that you've joined us here for our annual fall conference. This year's theme, as you all know, is Higher Powers, inspired by the work and life and witness of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. We are thrilled to have so many friends, old and new, joining us for this year's conference. As those of you who have participated in this conference for the past 19 years know that friendship is an essential feature of what we do at the center, and it's manifest in a dramatic way at the fall conference. Old friends are here, new friends will be made. Uh, it's, part, it's, a, it's part and parcel of the mission of this event and of our institution. For those of you who are not familiar with our work, the Center for Ethics and Culture is committed to sharing the richness of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition through teaching, research, and engagement at the highest levels across a range of disciplines. We do this through academic research and programming, of which the Fall Conference is the flagship and centerpiece of our efforts, along with our robust publication series with the University of Notre Dame Press, which includes, of course, the Center for Ethics and Culture Solzhenitsyn series, about which more later. We, of course, uh, are focused intently on student formation. We, uh, through our Soren Fellows program, we have over 250 undergraduate and graduate fellows uh, whom, to whom we provide special mentoring and, uh, and guidance uh, and summer internships, as well as uh, other academic opportunities. Um, we have, we, and of course, we engage in the public square uh, in the name of University of Notre Dame uh, in service of a wide variety of goods, but focused also primarily on trying to build a culture of life, both in the United States and worldwide. And finally, we, our fourth uh, element of what we do here at the Center for Ethics and Culture is we, and this is a relatively new initiative, is we have a dedicated program to assist the university in its goal of hiring for mission. We have dedicated funding that we allocate uh, in order to assist the university in its goal, its central goal, of creating a preponderance of uh, faculty members of this university who are passionate about its Catholic mission and seek to contribute to it both in their work and in their relationships with others. The Fall Conference is our largest annual event. It's truly a unique and exciting gathering of scholars, students, and guests from around the globe who come together every year to grapple with some of the most vital questions of ethics, culture, and public policy today. We have more, more than 750 guests who are registered for this event, more than 1,000 in attendance, and we're looking forward to spend time in conversation and reflection in the days ahead. Why did we choose the theme Higher Powers? What does that mean? Well, last year as we gathered for our 18th annual fall conference titled Through Every Human Heart, we took as our inspiration the great, great Russian author, historian, and Nobel Prize winner Alexander Solzhenitsyn drawing our title from his masterwork, The Gulag Archipelago. At that time, we launched the Center for Ethics and Culture Solzhenitsyn series with our partners at the University of Notre Dame Press with the promise that we would bring the works of this essential author to a new generation of readers, sharing Solzhenitsyn's prophetic voice and witness with a world that needs to hear him now more than ever. Last year, we realized we released the first volume in the series, March 1917, Node 3, Book 1, in Solzhenitsyn's masterwork, The Red Wheel. Tonight, immediately following our conversation, we will celebrate the release of the newest volume in this series, Between Two Millstones, Book 1, the first volume of Solzhenitsyn's memoir of his exile in the West, which has never before been translated into English. We are inordinately proud and humbled to bring these vital works to print helping to further establish Notre Dame as a premier destination for Solzhenitsyn scholarship and research. This new initiative has truly been a collaborative effort, and we are grateful to have a number of friends here this evening who helped make this partnership and tonight's event possible. First, I'd like to recognize Semyon Leandres, co-director of Notre Dame's program in Russian and East European Studies, and his wife, Natasha Leandres, head of the rare books and special collections in the Hesburgh Library. Natasha curated the beautiful and moving exhibit in the library, highlighting the personal stories of Solzhenitsyn's invisible allies. I hope you all have a chance to visit the exhibit during its open hours tomorrow. I'd also like to thank my very good friend, Steve Wren, director of Notre Dame Press, 
whose unflagging enthusiasm and entrepreneurial spirit and tireless efforts on behalf of this project have helped to make it such a success. Dan Mahoney, who has contributed his insights and expertise at every stage of the process, has been indispensable. Our friend Jeremy Beer, a great friend of the Solzhenitsyn family who helped make this partnership possible as well, is in attendance and, and we are grateful to him. And of course, we wanted to recognize Ignat Solzhenitsyn and his family, his son Dmitri is here with us this evening, who are so beautifully dedicated to Alexander's life and work, carrying his legacy forward for a new generation. We'd also like to welcome and recognize our friends and benefactors of the Center for Ethics and Culture, including two members of our Executive Advisory Committee, uh, Kathy Geshwin and Maureen Ferguson, who have joined us here this evening. In honor of Solzhenitsyn's centenary this year, we thought it only fitting to reflect on the ever-relevant themes in his work at this year's fall conference. The title, H Higher Powers, is drawn from Solzhenitsyn's 1993 address to the International Academy of Philosophy, in which the Nobel laureate observed that, quote, having refused to recognize the unchanging higher power above us, we have filled that space with personal imperatives, and suddenly life has become a harrowing prospect indeed. 25 years after Solzhenitsyn's prophetic address and 100 years after his birth, in more than 90 presentations throughout this conference, we will consider how every human pursuit can be oriented towards higher powers and we will reflect on the true measures of social progress, the role of morality and law and politics, the dynamics of liberty, dignity, self-sacrifice, and the good in public life. This great conversation begins tonight. And now, to introduce this evening's speaker, we are incredibly honored to begin this year's fall conference in conversation with a man truly steeped in the thought of work of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a man who daily observed the author at the height of his creativity and learned from his example, his son Ignat Solzhenitsyn, himself a distinguished artist, composer, and pianist. Ignat will be more fully introduced by and share a conversation with our dear friend, Professor Dan Mahoney, himself one of the world's preeminent Solzhenitsyn scholars. Daniel Mahoney holds the Augustine Chair in Distinguished Scholarship at Assumption College, where he has taught since 1986. He is a specialist in French political philosophy, anti-totalitarian thought, and the intersection of religion and politics. His books include The Liberal Political Science of Raymond Aron, 1992, De Gaulle, Statesman, Grandeur, and Modern Democracy, The Conservative Foundations of the Liberal Order, and the other Solzhenitsyn, telling the truth about a misunderstood writer and thinker. He is executive editor of Perspectives on Political Science and book review editor of Society. In 1999, he was awarded the Prix Raymond Aron. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Mahoney. Well, thank you, everyone. It's a real honor to be here tonight. And uh, of course, we want to thank the Center for Ethics and Culture and Notre Dame University Press for their commitment to the Solzhenitsyn series and to this renewal of uh, reflection on Solzhenitsyn's life and thought and literature in the United States. You may know that we've lagged badly behind some other nations, who knows, the Germans published uh, Between Two Millstones about a half dozen years ago under the title, My American Years. So we're, we're waiting to catch up with the Germans, but with the help of Notre Dame, we are. So any, anyway, it's a great honor to introduce Ignaz Solzhenitsyn, uh, who is the second of Solzhenitsyn's three sons. I think he's widely recognized as one of today's most gifted artists and he enjoys a very active and impressive career as conductor and pianist. Um, I could go on for a long time. He, he's conductor laureate of the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia. Spent a long time in Philadelphia. You were, you used to be, maybe you still are, the principal guest conductor of the Moscow Symphony Orchestra. Uh, he has, uh, led symphonies all over the United States and Europe and Asia and elsewhere, including many cities in Russia, and has partnered with world-renowned and world-class soloists, including Rostropovich. 
There's a wonderful video I saw of uh, Rostropovich and Ignat playing in Moscow shortly after the end of communism, and it's the kind of thing that lifts the human spirit. And Rostropovich, of course, had given um, uh, protection to Solzhenitsyn when he was being harassed by the KGB and uh, was very close to the Solzhenitsyn family, both in the Soviet Union, but also during Rostropovich's own Western exile. And if you're interested in hearing some of Ignat's music, I would recommend going to Amazon. Uh, you can listen to Solzhenitsyn play Schubert and Beethoven and Brahms and the war marches of Prokof uh, Prokofiev, and they're all wonderful. I listen to them in the car, driving <laughs> to Assumption College from time to time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know Ignat uh, principally in his role as um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's son. And what I mean by that is Solzhenitsyn's three sons, Jermelai, Stefan, Ignat, have a deep, an abiding commitment to their father's literary work, to his moral witness, to his uh, literary legacy, to his message about truth and responsibility and self-limitation. They know their father's work as well as anyone alive, uh, and they have increasingly in recent years been, especially Stefan and Ignat, committed to bringing the fullness of Solzhenitsyn's contribution to the Anglophone world. I said in print not too long ago that sometimes I got the impression that Solzhenitsyn criticism in the United States was sort of stuck in the mid-70s. You know, the French have been 30 years ahead of us, for example, in terms of the publication of Solzhenitsyn's works. But I think that's changing, again, with the help of the CEC in Notre Dame. And of course, Ignat and Stefan have been extremely and impressively active in helping bring Solzhenitsyn's masterwork. Solzhenitsyn said his masterwork was The Red Wheel. And in my view, it is a great work, a masterwork. Um, his other masterwork, of course, is The Gulag Archipelago. Our friend Georges Niva, the Franco-Swiss scholar, uh, calls these two works Solzhenitsyn's two great literary cathedrals. You know, the Gulag Archipelago is only 1,600 pages, but the Red Wheel is 6,000 pages. So we have a way to go, but uh, until last year, the only uh, two volumes of the Red Wheel available were the augmented August 1914 with the Stolypin cycle, a very great book indeed, November 1916, sort of the stillness before the deluge. And now, last October, we saw the publication of March 1917. We'll get into this tonight, but Solzhenitsyn came to the conclusion that the real revolution was not October. It was February 17, when the Russian old regime fell when weak and pusillanimous liberals and socialists came to power, it was only a matter of time before the Bolsheviks would come to power and decimate Russian culture, Russian politics, the Russian church. Trotsky famously says in his memoir that lifting power in October 17 was as easy as lifting a pen. So uh, this, uh, in any case, those are, we're going to talk a little bit, at some length, I hope, about these two great uh, literary cathedrals, but also about other aspects of Solzhenitsyn's life and work, some of his lesser-known writings, some of the tensions in his thought between being a publicist, interested in the contemporary world, committed to fighting the Soviet dragon, and his more fundamental mission as a belletrist and writer, some people call Solzhenitsyn a prophet. Some people call him a moral witness. Some people, like me, even suggest that he has the wisdom of a moral and political philosopher. So we could raise some of these issues. With the centennial, Ignat, I'd like to ask you, um, 
I thought of D.M. Thomas's problematic biography, but it had an interesting title. A Solzhenitsyn, A Century in a Life. And there's another biography of Solzhenitsyn that came out in French a couple years ago. I can't remember the exact title, but it was something to the effect like Seven Stages in a Life. And both titles, I, I, I suggest, convey simply how much was packed into Ale Alexander Isayevich's life. He was born December 11th, 1918, one of Lenin's children. By the 1930s, he had repudiated the faith of his fathers, the faith of his aunt Irina. He notes he pulled the crucifix from his neck. In Doroshenka, the trail, he speaks about getting up early on his honeymoon to read Das Kapital. And then, of course, he's arrested in February 45. I remember an interview with Daniel Kelman, the Austrian novelist that appeared in the New York Times and in Le Figaro, where Solzhenitsyn says, I shudder to think what kind of writer and human being I would have been because I would have been a writer if I had not been arrested in February 45. Why don't we start there? We're still early in those seven lives, but um, how important is that fact that Solzhenitsyn got caught up, that he, because of his correspondence with a high school friend, still a faithful Leninist, was arrested in February 45, and within, <laughs> 10 years, let's say, the Solzhenitsyn, who was recognizable to us all, is Solzhenitsyn. Yes, he says, he says in the Gulag, bless you, be blessed, whatever, I'm not sure the, how it says in English, my prison. He blesses his prison, and of course, by extension, his, his years in the camps for uh, drawing down, for removing that veil that had temporarily obscured his, his vision. As you say, he was reared, of course, as by, by his, only by his mother. His father had, had been killed in a, in a hunting accident, and she was devoutly orthodox, and, and raised him, tried to raise him that way against all the winds of uh, very powerful uh, uh, totalitarian, uh, aggressively atheist state. And as you say, he very quickly, within a matter of, by, by, by the young pioneer age, mm -hmm. succumbed to, to the inevitable. Uh, but his arrest and the first free conversations that he had had outside of his family, outside of his mother and maybe his aunt, mm -hmm. uh, were in Buturki prison, mm -hmm. where he came into contact with engineers, doctors, uh, peasants, uh, scientists and so on and, and so Christians. forth, officers, Christians, uh, but who having descended to this more or less, uh, uh, maybe not ninth circle of hell, but eighth circle of hell, uh, <laughs> were now able to speak freely because there was nothing more to lose. And already right. the se their sentences were, as many of you will know, were 10 years, 15 years, 25 years. So uh, yes, uh, without, that opportunity to be schooled uh, and reminded about uh, uh, the greater truths and about, about the, the outright lie that uh, dominated, uh, that, that was the, 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 the essence of Soviet, uh, of, the Soviets, of Soviet society. Uh, you know, it's a, very a man like Solzhenitsyn would have been, yes, yeah, a, it's very still a talented writer, but. Sure, it's very interesting to see Solzhenitsyn's self-presentation in the great novels, but especially in the autobiographical discussions of the Gulag. But as you know, there's that famous exchange between Nurjan, who was the autobiographical character in the first circle, and Rubin, the faithful communist. And already, the Sol this is the Christmas tide, 1948, already. 49. 49, thank you. Mm -hmm. Already, um, uh, the Sol the Solzhenitsyn character Nurjan is talking about self-limitation. He's speaking about moral freedom. 
He's speaking the language of good and evil. And he says at one point to Rubin, to hell with capitalism and socialism. He doesn't want to speak in ideological terms. He doesn't want to use the ideological cliches of the regime. But it's also interesting that Nersian is not Christian yet, but there's also a recognizably Solzhenitsyan worldview. You know, the recovery of the drama of good and evil in the human soul. And then I think of the chapters, let's say the ascent in the central section of the seven sections, the Gulag Archipelago, the Soul and Barbed Wire. Ignat already quoted the famous line at the end of the chapter, bless you prison for having been in my life. But there there's the beautiful poem where Solzhenitsyn says to the living God, I believe again, you know? Acathistus. And so um, um, there, there seems to have been this seven or eight year process by which first the scales of ideology fell from his eyes, then he turned to a sort of recognizable recognizably Solzhenitsyn account of the drama of good and evil, but then there's this more forthright affirmation of providence and faith in the living God. Um, and uh, that all seems to have occurred in a you know, seven or eight or nine year period. Yes, I, th I think for so many people that those formative years, what, what one always hears about formative years, the formative years tend to be teenage years, right? Or maybe 20s yeah. for people who are late growing up, you know? But, but uh, really for Solzhenitsyn, it was, yes, it was his mid and late 20s. Uh, it, was that, it was that time in prison uh, because he, uh, all of those aspects uh, of his ignorance or blindness as he came to see it, uh, were, were revealed to him at that point yeah. with regard to faith, with regard to uh, Russian history, which of course was the uh, really already then the great animating passion of his of his. It was life. only new before that was the Marxist Vulgate, right? Yeah, he had he had uh, inklings. Yeah, and I would yeah. say more than more. Uh, he t mentions uh, several times uh, the kind of a, this wonderful anecdote, a, a, tr a, true, a true moment you know, from, his, from his life, when Kirov, the great party boss of Leningrad, a, a, a great butcher him, himself, uh, was, uh, died. Uh, Pravda and all the official organs were full of encomiums and, and, and uh, praise and, 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 and just lavish recollections and so forth. And uh, I think Solzhenitsyn was 15 or 14, and, and reading the papers full of nothing but what was supposed to be official version, he felt this can't be right, He's, he must have been knocked off. Yeah. And he was alarmed uh, that nobody around him seemed, the adults who should know better, nobody seemed to understand that or even contemplate that possibility. Now, I'm sure some did. And to be in contact with reality. You know, right, to, to be able to experience right, and notice right. so he something had, real. So, so he had a sense. He had remember what the, what the two books that made him uh, that he, that made him want to be a writer were War and Peace and the Memoirs of Shulgin. Yes, who was a an important pre-revolutionary uh, cadet, the cadet party uh, leader in in Russia, and then of course forced to 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 leave. And but his his he his memoirs are fascinating on many, many accounts. And already at, at a very young age, maybe 10 years old, he knew that Russian history was had to be dug out somehow. But it's just that he didn't know how. He didn't know the method. It's quite striking when you open volume one of The Red Wheel, August 1914, that your father lists a series of dates for the composition of the work. And one of them for the chapter on the Battle of Tannenberg, which of course includes the suicide of General Samsonov, very much a representative of old Russia. That's March 36, right? Uh, uh, I think November. November, uh, November 36. 36. So, so he's 18 years of age. Not even, but yes, but yeah, close well, enough. Three weeks yes, later. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. November 36, and w what's interesting, he tells Pivot, uh, the, the French, uh, how would you describe Pivot? Just the, the, the great intellectual. Yes. Uh, in that 1983 interview, that 
the, those he chapters. He was the guy who had this famous book TV program called Apostrophe. Apostrophe. Yes. Higher level than Brian Lamb. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, uh, he tells people that these chapters that were written uh, that at the beginning w were virtually unchanged yeah. in the final version. Yeah, that's quite remarkable. Which is to say that they were written on a, on a, on a, on a, on a high level. And yeah. even the mature social needs and found little reason to tinker, uh, tinker with and them. His so it world, and his worldview from 36 to the late 60s and early 70s had changed so dramatically, and yet that description of Tannenberg and Samsonov is faithful enough to reality and to his own mature vision that he recognizes it and pays tribute to it in the first volume of The Red Wheel. Yes. Let me. Um, uh, let me ask you about these two literary cathedrals. Um, your mother had uh, written a very has written a very beautiful introduction to the Russian abridgment of the Gulag Archipelago. The Gulag Archipelago is taught in Russian high schools, and um, there's also, if you're interested in this, there's a, the English uh, edition prepared by our our mutual friend Edward Erickson in cooperation with Social Needs and in the early 80s, but there's this uh, edition prepared in, what's it, 2010, 2009? Well, originally earlier. No, 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 not not Ed's, uh, your, your mother's. Um, yes, uh, yeah, you're right, Somewhere, somewhere around 2009, there. I think. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, but. Um, um, Much later than Eric's. Uh, in that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a certain difficulty in coming to terms with the Gulag Archipelago, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. It's possible, I suspect, for people to interpret the book too narrowly politically in the sense that, well, that's yesterday's news. You know, that's the Soviet Union, it's gone. And there's a lot of retrospective anti-communists, you know, people who really weren't anti-communists, but who now say, let's not talk about the lessons of communism because it's all yesterday's news. But um, it seems to me George Kennan was right in a review in the New York Review of Books in 1975 when he said the Gulag Archipelago is the greatest indictment of a political regime ever written. At the same time, uh, Solzhenitsyn himself says in the very famous chapter on the Blue Caps, if you think this book is a mere political indictment, slam its slam cover shut. shut. Yeah. I think those things are both true. And this is where this, uh, this, uh, this uh, passage which I'm about to read to the audience is highlighted by your mother when she reflects on what kind of book the Gulag Archipelago is. And she says it's sui generis. It's an indictment of totalitarianism. It's autobiographical. It's an account of the Soviet prison and camp system. It's a work of spiritual meditation and philosophy. But she says, finally, it's an epic poem. It's all those things, but it's also an epic poem. And she talks about this famous um, couple of short paragraphs where Solzhenitsyn says, so let the reader who expects this book to be a political expose slam, in the narrow sense, slam its cover shut right now. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? And then Solzhenitsyn goes on. There's a comparable passage in The Ascent. Gradually, the line between good and evil, you know, quite, there are two passages that fit together very beautifully. During the line of any heart, this line keeps changing place. Sometimes it is squeezed one way by exuberant and evil, and sometimes it shifts to allow enough space for good to flourish. One and the same human being is at various times under various circumstances a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood, but his name doesn't change, and to that name we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. Socrates taught us know thyself. So Sojourner is suggesting there's the book ultimately points toward authentic self-knowledge. 
a rediscovery of the great and enduring drama between good and evil in the human soul. So I was wondering if you would comment about that and also your mother's argument that at some deep level, this is an epic poem about the journey of the soul. Yeah, it's a striking formulation. I, I, I don't ever recall reading that or hearing that from, from anybody else, but, but, uh, or for, including from her. But when, when, when I read her, that, that text, it, it was, uh, I found it as striking as, as you do. Because yes, uh, what, what Solzhenitsyn is interested in, primarily, first and foremost, is, is, is who we are and how it can be that we perpetrate such acts upon each other. Mm. And yes, not that the bad people do it and the good people suffer, but that each one of us has that capability. Mm. Furthermore, he, his experience, as, uh, as many of you will know, led him to believe that it did not take very much to push a person into to that darker side. Did not, it did not have to be unspeakable torture, which certainly was, was in, at certain Soviet periods uh, absolutely routine and commonplace. Uh, it did not have to be uh, really uh, uh, um, too much in terms of, uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of loss, loss of position, loss of family, loss of uh, privilege and so forth to see what man is capable of. And, and so if it were only about communism, uh, communism is a specific, uh, a specific evil, but really it's still a, 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 sub, a subspecies of, of something larger. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's what interested him. You most. know, uh, there's a beautiful passage, the, one of my favorites in the Blue Caps, where Solzhenitsyn is talking about the NVK, NKVD recruiters coming to his school. And he says, you know, he and his friends were communists, Komsomol members, etc., And they're being told, you can, you can be heralds of the revolution, you can be heroes of socialist society, you can make more money, you can have the girls. And he says something inside of us, certainly something inside of him, revolted at the thought of becoming an, an, a blue cap or an NKVG. And he, he says that it has something to do with the copper coins left by our fathers and grandfathers at a time when morality was not relative. So here Solzhenitsyn is a communist, and yet there are these sort of copper coins that have been left to him that are still in his consciousness and heart, even as a young Marxist, that tell him, you don't want to be an NKVD agent. Yeah, and somehow those, uh, those remnants of, of, of morality were very hard to kill off uh, for, the, for, for, for a, 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 a regime that was, whose primary yeah. purpose, or one of its two or three main purposes was to destroy the family and destroy, destroy religion. You know, so just t t this morning I was reading an article by, uh, by someone, uh, who grew up in that in the recent Soviet times, in other words, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and she made the point that religion was banned, ver effectively banned. Uh, speaking about God was not only dangerous and, 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 and inappropriate, uh, and, but and illegal at times, but foolish, laughable, uh, risible, how could serious progressive people speak about God and speak about superstition and all of those things. And she, she makes the point, and yet the tradition of going to cemeteries to pay homage to, to the dead and to visit dead relatives persisted mm. without, interestingly, without much interference from, mm -hmm. from the regime. And she said, how, how, and as a child, vis going to visit her grandmother's and her great aunts and whoever else was buried. Mm -hmm. and so she, she felt this, that, mm. wh why are we doing this if all the adults say that this is, this is, the, this is all superstition? Why, mm. why visit a bunch of bones and, and dust? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a wonderful Instructive. point. Instructive. It's a wonderful point. Uh, let me ask you, uh, I mean, this is a Western audience, and uh, 
Between Two Millstones, Volume One, has just been published, which deals, of course, Solzhenitsyn was forcibly exiled from the Soviet Union. And by the way, other, unlike other members of the Third Immigration, he didn't want to be a, he didn't want to go to the West. He wanted to stay home and fight and write. But he was exiled on February 13th, uh, 1974. And uh, he remained here until May of 1994, a 20-year exile. Volume one covers the, more or less the Harvard Address in uh, the summer of 78, and volume two will pick up and, and, and go until 1994. Seems to me that when people know anything about Solzhenitsyn, and I mean people who were well disposed to Solzhenitsyn, who admire his spiritual vision, who admire uh, his struggle against communism, who admire his literary talent and courage, they all seem to think in some way he's anti-Western. Hmm. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that for a little bit because it is true that Solzhenitsyn at Harvard spoke about the weakness of the West as he did in his AFL-CIO talks a few years before. But he famously says at the beginning of the Harvard Address that he's saying some bitter things, but he speaks as a friend, as a friend. and not an adversary. And, um, uh, and you know, in Between Two Molestones, when he talks about the reaction of the Harvard Address, he was really quite surprised. He said, I thought America was a free country and you could speak the truth. But he says two years later in Foreign Affairs, you could only attack America from the left. Uh, but to say that there was something substantial and admirable in the West, but that it was decaying and declining, and the West needed to fortify its resources, including its older spiritual and cultural resources, that was unacceptable. And, but Solzhenitsyn also says in Between Two Millstones that there was another America. And he noticed from letters and small town editorials, et cetera, that there were millions of Americans who resonated with his message. And he took hope from that. So maybe you could talk a little bit about this relationship between Solzhenitsyn and the West and then Solzhenitsyn and America. Well, as you say, he says, where is it? By the way, when I don't know where a quote is from or where a passage is from, I ask, Dan, because Dan really is the, is, is, is the great expert on, on everything Solzhenitsyn wrote. But so where is it that he says, I am not an enemy of the West, I'm an enemy, and you already used of the weakness of the West. Of the weakness of the West. During the uh, so interviews is, is, in England, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there, there, there are a couple of things there. First of all, there is the weakness of the West. What is the weakness of the West? Uh, primarily at that moment, it was the domino effect of the communist red wave sweeping across the world. And uh, so much of the focus has been in the Cold War on Europe, yeah. underst understandably, but it wasn't just Europe, Africa, Vietnam, uh, Latin America, and so forth. Uh, and in Europe, Portugal, Greece, on the brink of in 75, 74, right. yeah, yeah. So this was a time that really- and no one knew where Spain was going either. No, Spain. So, so, so it was very much up for grabs how mm -hmm. quickly communism would spread or w indeed that it would win. Also, uh, it was a time of what is re universally recognized in America now as malaise, right? That's always the word one hears, the Carter presidency and before that the Vietnam, the whole uh, morass of Vietnam. And, in the Mal and so, r regardless, it was not a great time for Western clarity, for Western confidence, for Western conviction, I think, uh, in its own civilization, in its own beliefs. Mm -hmm. So one aspect was a warning, and that's the title of another uh, a collection of, of, of essays, a warning to the West, and to say, wake up. You don't know who you're dealing with, or too many of you are asleep at the switch. And he spoke about the spirit of Munich in the Nobel Lecture. The spirit of Munich. Yeah. Right? This uh, uh, collaborationist uh, approach, close one's eyes and hope everything will be okay. 
uh, it most assuredly was not. And, and how many times do we have to learn that same lesson? So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect was his, uh, his sense that Russian, the Russian path had uh, for already for a long time, for a thousand years, had been, let's not say messianic, let's not say uh, unique, but yes, all, 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 all paths are unique. But the point is it was its own path. And he just wanted to defend some space for Russia to develop as it continued to, as it, as it attempted to survive communism and eventually to craft some kind of post-communist future, which we're living in now, an attempt somehow to, to emerge, that Russia should not blindly <coughs> mimic whatever comes from the West. And so while recognizing the great traditions of, uh, of particularly of Western political philosophy, of Western uh, civic freedom, church, civic freedom of, res of respect for the individual, uh, the sanctity of the in individual tied in, of course, with, with Christian uh, traditions. But he felt that R Russia should not, why should Russia, or any other country, but he was speaking as a Russian, take, take from the West uh, everything, and so that's, that's especially since the West was increasingly losing sight of the greatness of its own tradition. You know, the Harvard Address, Solzhenitsyn says, at the time of the American founding, there was a recognition of the con uh, the connection between liberty and religious responsibility, and he says we're letting go of those great reserves of mercy and sacrifice. Right. So the, there's a crisis in the West. Well, so and, and and maybe that's that's the that's the the, the final uh, piece of that puzzle is that in the Harvard Address most clearly and most famously, he st studies that common heritage of humanism yeah. and communism. Yeah. And the, you know, these two, two <laughs> John Paul's uh, two lungs of the, right? Uh, right. So, but here this is kind of in the pervert, per perverted way, two lungs of the same organism. Right, uh, that, right. That, and, and that's what he suspected and I think I think time has shown him to be very much correct. A humanism. That, that humanism that and communism, not to, <laughs> not to equate them, but just to say that they have common right. ancestry and a common, a common vision. And therefore, is, and that, that really was the crux, as yeah, you say, yeah, yeah. one cannot criticize. That's the, the deepest the part of the yeah, Harvard That's Edition. the real, the, the crux of it is that somewhere there's a, a spiritual, now, Humanism is a, it's well, above my pay grade, I, I how we define it. I think it's Solzhenitsyn's expl explanation for why so many famous Western intellectuals were indulgent to communist totalitarianism. They saw it as a more complete expression of anthropocentric humanism than a West that still was half torn by its Hedging its bets. What's yeah. that? Hedging its bets. Yeah, that's yes. right, that's yes. right. Um, let me ask you, this is a largely Catholic audience. I, I'm not taking a poll. I'm just um, using my powers of empirical observation. Um, I think this audience, uh, since we have uh, Between Two Millstones, Volume Two coming out next year, and it has a wonderful discussion about the meeting that John Paul II and Solzhenitsyn had in the afternoon of October 15th, 1993, mm -hmm. the 15th anniversary of John Paul II's pontificate. But there's sort of a story there. Uh, there's an interview with Yanis Sapietz in 1979, uh, uh, January 79, where uh, Sapietz asked Solzhenitsyn, what do you think of the election of the Slavic Pope? And he says, I quote, words fail me, it's a gift from God. And then of course there's the meeting, and then your father issued a very beautiful statement about John Paul II when he died in April of 2005. By the way, Dostoevsky would not have issued a statement about the <laughs> glories of the Slavic Pope. Um, so say something about that, that this affinity or this, certainly this admiration and respect that your father had for John Paul II. Uh, I, I, I'm sure, in, especially in front of this audience that, that, that uh, uh, John Paul II, uh, everybody knows, uh, what a, what, a, what a great man he was. 
great man, a, a man who carried that fundamental uh, dignity uh, of the human spirit uh, under God, but yeah. but 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 the, but the uh, uh, um, human dignity and respect for for it across across the world. For Solzhenitsyn, I think for for I think for every Russian, not, not to mention the, the Poles, but for really for every person from that Eastern Bloc, from the communist, uh, from under the communist yoke, this election re really was s seen as a, as a, mm -hmm, as a miracle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to have uh, a man who had, s had al already such a, such a track record of strength and courage uh, and uh, unwillingness to compromise on what really mattered. To have him emerge as I, I don't. I wasn't old enough to. I, I remember it, the election of John Paul II. I don't remember if he was. And forgive my ignorance. Was he a likely can, choice? Uh, was he a favorite? I don't. I, I don't. I don't remember what that. What, Some people what in this room was. might know the answer to that. I uh, think he was a surprising so choice. A bit of a surprise. I think. It was a all complicated of, by the death of John Paul John, the uh, first so quickly. Um, but so, uh, at, at any rate, but yes. Uh, a, a great man and someone someone that Solzhenitsyn admired virtually yeah. without without reservation and someone who not only in, I think in the in the of course in the in the story of the Catholic Church but 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 in the story of all of Christ, Christendom if we can still use that word and uh, certainly in in the history of man yeah. in the history of people in the history of the the ultimately the doom of communism played a fantastic, noble, magnificent role. Well, very well said. Uh, let me ask you about a theme. It's such an important theme in your father's work in the 70s. He repeated it in his final great interview with the Spiegel in July 2007. He, uh, and it's a major theme in between two millstones, which you're all going to buy. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, he, was your father was deeply disconcerted, and I could name all the texts, so I named some of them, by the fact that too many people in the West confused Russia with the Soviet Union. Yes. And that failed to see that the Russians along with the Ukrainians were the first and principal victories, the victims of the communist behemoth. And he warned, and it seems to me his arch nemesis, Richard Pipes, who collapsed the Soviet Union with eternal Russia has really had a much deeper impact, especially in a world you and I know well, American conservatism. I'm on the board of National Review Magazine and I'm constantly struggling with my fellow conservatives to show some sympathy for Russia, not to simply see the present post-communist Russia as a neo-Soviet order to acknowledge some facts, like the religious revival, or the place of Solzhenitsyn in the educational system, or an event the Solzhenitsyn Center played a large role in, the building of the major and significant mon monument in, in Moscow on October 30th, 2017, to the victims of communism. I know Memorial and the Solzhenitsyn, is the Solzhenitsyn Foundation or Center? Solzhenitsyn Foundation. Foundation. Yeah played major roles in supporting that. And these are things that are simply not known in the West. No one knows about them. So I bring this up is why, why do so many people persist against your father's advice and judgment in seeing eternal Russia as the hereditary enemy of the West? It, it, it's, a, it's a profoundly vexing question uh, 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 to which I don't have an answer. And, but it does lead one to ask in, in turn whether, whether the enemy really was communism. Mm. Now, on the left, I think it's a different conversation and it's uh, it, maybe a conversation for another, sort of for, for another, uh, another, another time. But on the right, in other words, the, the American conservatives and, and, and centrists, if you will, but anybody who wasn't a fellow traveler uh, of, of, uh, of communism, uh, 
one thought stood for stood against communism, stood against yeah. oppression, stood against atheism, stood at, certainly militant athe forced atheism, and so on. The, the lack of free markets, lack of freedom of the press, lack of freedom of religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if that was the case, then why has nothing changed at all, uh, or, or, or almost nothing has changed since, since the Cold War? Uh, this, either that means that Russia has not changed, which is manifestly not true, or it means that, well, communism really wasn't the enemy, the real enemy was Russia was the geopolitical space. And then it just gets into who wins and who loses and who has more tanks and who has bases and uh, where and, 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 and that kind of endless uh, tr uh, tr uh, Trotsky's permanent revolution. Right, so it's right, kind of right. permanent, permanent conflict, permanent if we win then somebody has to lose. I think we right. know from enlightened economic theory that that's not, that, that eco economics is not a zero sum game and that everybody right. can win if it's done properly. Right. If a society is built according right. to free, free, uh, free markets, free peoples, right. and so forth, uh, so why can't that be to be at least contemplated in the realm of geopolitics? So that's 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 really, of course, a, a huge, a huge question for today. And, and part of it's the cultural divide too. Uh, uh, Russia today is wary of dechristianization, transgenderism, homosexual marriage, all the kind of stuff that is seen as an essential ingredient of advanced modernity. And uh, so in that, this is why- well, I can't resist to say, I think, I think President Obama was against those things in 2013. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a fast evolving yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. world, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. But the, the, yeah, arc so history, the arc of history, the arc of history. The arc of history has been yeah, bent, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. that way, so. Uh, let me but, ask you, let mm. me ask you about your father and patriotism. Another yeah. thing everyone knows about Solzhenitsyn is he's this extreme nationalist who, you know, want, you know. Your father <laughs> you spoke know. about repentance and self-limitation. He wanted all the constituent republics of the Soviet Union to go their own way. He spoke in an interrogative way about the possibility of a Slavic Union among Ukrainians and Russians. But essentially, he said, empire had destroyed the Russian character, the Russian people. Uh, he has a beautiful definition of patriotism, which he says, patriotism is an integral and persistent feeling of love for one's homeland with a willingness to make sacrifices for her, to share her troubles, but not to serve her unquestionably, not to support her unjust claims, rather to frankly assess her faults, her transgressions, and to repent for these. But he also quotes Sergei Bulgakov, the great priest and theologian, who said, you only have the right to criticize your country if you love her, like a mother. In other words, the modern, facile intellectual, the cosmopolitan intellectual who hates nations and hates loyalty, in a way, doesn't have a right to criticize because they're not committed to their country. So, Maybe you could illuminate for us a little bit why what I see is a passionate but moderate and humane self-critical patriotism is almost universally characterized as Slavophilism, yeah. imperialism, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as you've pointed out many times, it's, it's, it's difficult to reconcile, it's impossible to reconcile uh, what uh, many people say, some people say, uh, uh, about Solzhenitsyn's views, in other words, the views they attribute to him with what he actually wrote. Uh, in the case of this, this broad issue, part of it, I suppose, is nomenclature, terminology. He differentiated that beautiful, thoughtful uh, attempt at defining patriotism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he contrasted with nationalism. Now, I think in the, in the American right today, for example, that's not necessarily defined the same way. So I think, I think terminology aside though, for Solzhenitsyn, nationalism effectively was saying we're better, we're number one, P period. We're, I, I, for whatever country, we're, patriotism was, yes, a love informed by, by all the, by an attempt to see as honestly as possible strengths and weaknesses, and especially mm -hmm. weaknesses, especially faults. You'd mentioned that 
in his view, Russians were the first or the, the first and the, the, the greatest, perhaps, victims of, of communism. I think that's, that's true, but it's just as true that he felt Russia, Russians were the first perpetrators of communism. In other words, who did it? We did it to ourselves, first and foremost. So no question. And he was appalled he, by what happened to the Balts and the Czechs in 68 and... Absolutely, uh, the, the, the greatest shame of, uh, of his, uh, of, the, of the adult life uh, of, of any Russian of that generation was the Budapest, uh, the suppression of the Budapest uh, Hungarian uprising in 1956 and then, and then of course uh, uh, Prague in 1968. Particularly Prague, because this was coming at a time when supposedly there had been some some thaw and some 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 détente, and, yeah, yeah. and, and you know the first the first iteration, détente 1.0, and and uh, and then and then Prague, and how could this happen? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so he felt a, a profound guilt as as a Russian for what a, what a, what we have done, the evil we've brought mm -hmm. to to all these people uh, uh, around Europe and, and for that matter uh, in Asia and, else, and elsewhere. But I think that also he felt then that we, had, we as Russians had the right to, at, at least just to, 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 to say that we've also suffered. Yeah. From, yes, from ourselves, nobody yeah. to blame, but, yeah, but yeah. Uh, your, your father, don't deny us that right. Uh, would you agree that maybe in this regard your father's most important essay is the repentance and self-limitation in the life, in of, the life of nations, yes. Because categories in life of nations. Because there, he he despises a kind of masochism where you hate your country. At the same time, he wants a patriotism that's penitential. It's really quite a spiritual right. balance, you know, when you think right. about it. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, what's your favorite uh, two or three works by your father? Well, of course, you mentioned. <laughs> the two cathedrals. I don't always agree with everything Niva writes, but but that's a that's a, a wonderful pithy uh, way of encapsulating these these unparalleled, gigantic and very very great works: uh, the Red Wheel and the Gulag Archipelago. Um, I guess I would say. So, in other words. We all know about those works. We all know about right. one, one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. And, and first circle, um, in first, the first circle, circle, cancer ward. I mean, these kind of go without w without saying. I love them all. I love them in different ways because they are also different. From, your mother from, once said her favorite other. work I, by your your dad is the last one she read. <laughs> yes, and that's that's as good an answer as any. But I think I would just mention uh, m mention uh, a work that's very special to me uh, is the trail. And yeah. you mentioned the Rozhenka in Russian. That's a work that is still barely known, certainly in the English world, because it's, most of it is still unavailable. Chapter five, Prussian Nights. Uh, chapter nine, Prussian Nights, was translated by Robert Conquest um, in, the, in the 70s. Uh, and then chapter five, Besid, uh, in, was translated by myself. Uh, and those two, two are the, the only- In the Solzhenitsyn Reader. The only, in the Solzhenitsyn Reader. Yeah. And those are the only two chapters that have appeared so far. But this is uh, a auto, a, a completely autobiographical poem of about 9,000 lines <laughs> that was written by memory, all in his head, in the camps, uh, for the simple reason that pen, paper, and writing of any kind was not allowed. And uh, how, how would one describe this monstrous reality? How could one ever convey it? It has to be written. But how can it be written when one can't write? as verse inside one's head. And then search me, and he says that in, in the introduction, inception of the poem, go ahead, I'm, I'm, I'm bare. There's nothing, there's nothing here, you will never reach what's inside. And uh, this, this poem, although he never claimed uh, to be, to be a, a poet, and was a kind of a poet by necessity, but this work uh, is uh, something that I come back, more, come back to over and over, and a work I hope to see in English uh, in full before too long. Can I add as an addendum, addendum for this audience, Solzhenitsyn had the Lithuanians in the camps make him an extra large rosary bead as a mnemonic method so he could memorize works like 
uh, uh, Dorshenka, and he comments wryly that they were quite impressed by his piety. You yeah. know, this, uh, this very large rosary beads that uh, sir allowed him to memorize 12, was it? Well, especially because, 7,000 yeah. or 12,000? I, th I think it's 9,000 lines. 9,000 lines. Honestly, we're still waiting for an edition that has the, you know, the proper academic, you know, academic edition that will uh, have absolutely. the, you know, the line numbered and, and, and I suppose yeah. somebody has the answer. All right, we're, yeah, yeah. we're gonna turn things over to Carter because we could talk all night. So we're gonna turn things over no, to no, Carter. No, so we're just, this is, not a, this is not an ending, but it's a beginning. We're gonna continue our conversation. We're gonna open up the floor for questions uh, directed to our wonderful con uh, conversationalists here. Come to the microphones. There are microphones on the upper level. There are microphones on the lower level. We'll recognize you. Please tell us your name uh, and then uh, ask a question. And I think there'll probably be quite a few questions, so please keep it brief if possible and make sure it's a question. Uh, and, uh, and we will uh, we'll begin with this we gentleman here. We do enough of these. They're not always okay. questions. Frame your question in the form of a question. Is it, is it working? <laughs> okay, my name is Cristobal Orrego. I'm professor of jurisprudence in the Catholic University of Chile and guest professor here in the Jacques Maritain Center. Uh, my question is, about a passage in, in, in the address to Harvard, which is very impressive about the cowardice of the West and how this cowardice is one of the main problems because people don't dare to say the truth. And re in relation to that quest, to, to that, um, uh, so to say, opinion of your father, I would like to ask you, which truths do you think that are being suppressed today and that we are very coward not to tell the truth to the, to the people who are suppressing these truths. Thank you. What, I'm not sure I heard. What, what, the question is cowardice. It's a question where about. Yeah, but where's the passage from? The, the, oh, where was the passage? I think you mean. The Harvard the, Address. The, the He's attributing it to the Harvard Address. The courage in the Harvard Address. Yeah. Well, I mean, I. I, I, uh, I, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't think that. That uh, there's any there's any great secret to 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 what he's uh, to what to what he's saying uh, truths truths about who again about who about who we are about 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 uh, the nature of, of humanity the nature of human condition and how I suppose he would say as many many others would say how little we change. As uh, even as our history and evolves, even as our technology moves forward, even as supposedly we live better and better and better, as he says in in, in Harvard, uh, in the Harvard address, it, oh, or in, in Templeton uh, uh, lecture, or maybe I'm I'm conflating. Anyway, he says if if man were born uh, only for happiness, he would not be born to die. Harvard. Hello, my name is Donald Sheff from Michigan. Um, question I have is if your father was alive today, what advice do you think he would have for the new generation of Russians here um, in Russia today? He, I think he attempted to give some advice to younger Russians uh, when, uh, well, throughout his life, but particularly when he came back and he was able to actually address them uh, quite openly, although he was cut off from doing that on TV at that time under 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 uh, Yeltsin, but um, probably his message was, as I something I already referred to, don't be so quick to cast off entirely this patrimony uh, that through all these through this whole nightmare of the Soviet years somehow you've still inherited. Don't automatically assume everything that comes from the West is uh, worthy of, of imitation. No doubt, many things are. Maybe most things, but not, but not everything. Allow some room for, for, for a, 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 a unique, uh, a, a, an original uh, kind of uh, Russian way, modest as it, as it might be. Perhaps. And even, even with political liberty, he spoke about the Zemstvos of the 19th century, that Russia had its own traditions of provincial and local liberty that needed to be rethought in a new context. 
There is a book called A Minute a Day. Uh, it's in Russian and French. And there are speeches that Solzhenitsyn gave mainly in 94, 95 at Saratov, these other universities. He spoke to city groups. He, uh, but he speaks about, and some of his television broadcasts, but he speaks yeah. about education. He speaks about rekindling the Russian spirit, the resuscitation of the church. You know, the hopes he had that, I think as Ignat very nicely put, that um, the best of the Russian tradition could become a source for civic and spiritual and cultural renewal. Father Ed Andreko, and I'm with the McGrath Institute for Church Life uh, here at Notre Dame. Could you tell us something about your father's relationship or uh, dealings with Gorbachev? Hmm. Well, uh, he did not think much of, of Gorbachev, I think is, not, is no secret. Although history uh, lends all of us, uh, of course, a, 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 a perspective. That's the point as we, as we live on, as we look back, as we study history. And uh, in certain ways, Gorbachev has looked, has looked better, perhaps, certainly to Russians. He's always looked great in the West, or to the West, right? Oh, uh, you remember how, how kind of uh, with, with uh, joy he was, he was, he was hailed. Uh, from all sides of the spectrum, but uh, they did not, I don't think they, did they meet? I'm I don't think they ever met, or if they did, I don't think they ever met. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember now. Certainly there was no substantive meeting. Uh, and and uh, Gorbachev actively resisted not just the return of Solzhenitsyn's citizenship and, and, and right to live in his country and right, right to return, but most importantly for him, uh, the publication of his books. I don't think I phrased that very well, but in other words, he, he did not want them to be published, and he fought tooth and nail for that not to happen until finally, as in so many other things, he, he gave in to the enormous, enormous pressure. So, as, remember, as late as uh, Gulag Archipelago's uh, finally is published 19, December of 89 or December of 90, uh, but at any rate, uh, right that same, that same year, he's still saying, my heart beats in a, in a socialist fashion. I'm a socialist, I'm a committed, I wasn't using the word communist as much then, but Solzhenitsyn has no place in our society and so forth. Uh, rebuilding Russia, which was a, 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 a wonderfully thoughtful and articulate uh, attempt to sort out these millions uh, uh, of issues facing facing crises facing Russia as it emerged from communism, Gorbachev said, "Oh yes, I I uh, I, I I read it with a pencil, meaning you know with, with pencil in hand." And uh, his views are outdated. They're monarchist. They're well, you know that's that's if is anything that? is in rebuilding Russia is not monarchism. So so again, what what that shows about Gorbachev is not is not to his credit. Uh, but um, so I guess that's the answer. Uh, Nicholas Del Rosal from Christendom College. So theology, history, and literature are three things that are very important to any culture. So my question is, which of those three would your father say is most important in retaining or rebuilding a Russian cultural identity in the wake of communism? Rebuilding Russian cultural identity in the wake of communism, well, what is it called in America and um, amongst conservatives? The three-legged stool uh, for right economic conservatives and and sort of defense conservatives and then and then social conservatives, and and that was Reagan's coalition, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dare to to presume which of those three could be pulled out, and 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 the stool could still stand. Look, I mean I think for a writer the language was always first and foremost. He felt, and he writes about that in, in, in several essays, that what defines a person, a per, what defines a per, so much of what defines a person, despite protestations to the contrary uh, in vogue in, in both East and West uh, recently, is nationhood, a sense of belonging. And what defines nationhood is not blood or 
you know, one thirty seconds of, of, of what, whatever blood you may be, but, but, it, but, his, but his identity is essentially self, that's another popular word today, self, self-identification, right? And so actually Solzhenitsyn believed, I think very strongly, that being Russian or German or Jewish or Polish or whatever, American was self-identification. Doesn't matter what the blood says, doesn't matter what the genetics, uh, what the genes say, it's, it's, it's what, whom do I love? Where do I belong? Who do I want, whom do I want to help? So, so yeah, L- language and therefore literature. Theology, I mean, he wouldn't dare to, I mean, he certainly was, not, was, no, was no theologian, and, but, but obviously recognized the importance of, of religion. And then history, well, again, a kind of a professional hazard. Uh, uh, he, he was a historian by, 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 by default, if you will, as, as a, uh, at, at attempt to uncover that hidden, hidden Russian past. So uh, I doubt he would agree to, to uh, remove any, any of those three. Wonderful question. Could I just add, uh, Solzhenitsyn was, uh, we all who appreciate Solzhenitsyn see the Christian resonances in his work, but he was very discreet about articulating any specifically religious or theological views. And when he was, when he was off, when he accepted the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion, it was really the first time he had laid out in some detail some of his theological reflections. Mm-hmm. And I think he says he was grateful for that, but it was a challenge. So Solzhenitsyn was a great Christian. He was a man, I think, who was a partisan of the soul against all the assaults on it, but he wasn't a theologian. And that's uh, maybe an important distinction to make. Hi, my name is Ben Marsh. I'm from, uh, also from Christian College. Um, you, you mentioned briefly uh, the importance of patriotism uh, in your conversation. And also, given the fact that we're uh, fast approaching the thousand-year anniversary of the Great Western Schism, do you think that your father would have seen the East and West as fundamentally reconcilable in uh, ideology and culture? Absolutely. Yes. I think uh, two sides of the same being, two lungs of the same organism, absolutely. I think he would subscribe to that, and uh, unlike maybe Dostoevsky, uh, whom, whom, whom Dan mentioned, and even with Dostoevsky, I think it's, 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 it's exaggerated. So Solzhenitsyn didn't see this, 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 uh, uh, this uh, unrelated path for Russia, that Russia has just everybody leave us alone, and we'll leave everybody alone and pursue something that nobody has ever seen or heard of before, no. That Russia's destiny was very much, I don't know, with the West is the right word, but, but in, you know, Putin's favorite word, partners, and, and, you know, in partnership with the West. And I think, I think that's probably uh, a, a good way to describe, uh, to describe how Solzhenitsyn would have, would have uh, thought how we can go forward. I mean, he says in that 1994 interview in Forbes magazine, very short, but tantalizing and, and, and uh, 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 prescient um, interview where he speaks that, that, that uh, about the coming realignment of the world as, 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 it, as it seemed to him and that uh, Russia may yet be, that, that America or the West at large may yet need Russia as an ally in terms of what other forces are rising in the world. And sort of Forbes says, well, what other forces are rising? He says, well, you know, wait and see. Uh, but I think we've, I think we've seen, we've seen um, since 1994, many changes in the world that, uh, uh, that, that perhaps uh, go some way to addressing, addressing that, that question. That Russia and the West may have, have, have a shared, if not uh, a fused uh, destiny. That's, at least I would like to think that. Uh, yeah, Michael Platt is my name. One of the earliest pictures one knows of you and your brothers is with a big dark stone in Cavendish. And the story that goes with it is your dad is telling you it's a truly a bird and it's going to take you back to Russia. Um, what t- 
teaching about your own identity and the relation of America and Russia uh, go, went along with that, but also more generally, uh, might you want to say something about your dad as a father? Uh, did so he ever spank you? <laughs> <laughs> what was the what was the part uh, you said the teaching about America? Just could you repeat that part of the question? Uh, you, the, the recent question got me thinking. America, Russia. There you are with your brothers, right? And your dad. If you tell us, is saying something about we are going back to Russia, and is, so there's something. You mean the Pegasus, the horse? Yeah. First of all, right, right. Yeah. This, this, the, there's a large a, boulder. Yes. Yeah, I've and, seen the picture. Yeah. Right. He told us. Now we were three and four and five and six. Yeah. Right. And right, he said it's a magic, magic horse. It's a horse that's been uh, uh, that is under a spell. Mm -hmm. It's a called Dovanikoin. <laughs> so cast under a spell. And when, when the time comes, when Russia is free, mm -hmm. becomes free, mm -hmm. casts off that yoke of communism, then this horse will come alive and will mm -hmm. fly, us, fly <laughs> us home, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and uh, it was a, uh, a, I don't know if we ever believed that, or, or <laughs> but it was a, it was a, I think wonderfully. You, you just proved he was the only person who thought the regime would fall. <laughs> you know he, that comes up in the in the 1983 interview with Muggeridge. Yeah. Malcolm Muggeridge is probably a name many of you, particularly in the Catholic community, mm -hmm. uh, will will recognize and deeply admire. And yes, he believed it. He believed it actually not only in the Muggeridge interview, immediately in the first interview of Sapiets. In yes. uh, the 14th of February, 1974. So the day after, still in at Bill's house in Frankfurt, mm -hmm. he says, "I this is temporary. I believe I'll go back. Mm -hmm. Not just through my books, but physically." And yeah, uh, mm -hmm. nobody believed it. My mother didn't really believe that. She wanted to believe it. She acted like I, I think that's part of. Maybe uh, one definition of courage is that it doesn't matter what the result will be, we still fight, mm -hmm. or we still do what's right, and so, and so that, I think, was her attitude. Of course, we fight for that, of course, we live for that, but did she think it would happen? She, she's admitted, and I don't think she ever pretended otherwise, that it's fanciful to, to imagine that this, for the younger people here, it's, it's, it's hard to think now, uh, hard to imagine maybe how, how uh, powerful that, that that and menacing that that monolith that behemoth yeah. uh, of communism was a very short time ago uh, and uh, yeah not many you know Ignat, I think it may, might have had something to do with your father's confidence in the power of the gulag archipelago you know in oak in the calf and elsewhere he says Burnham wood is moving that somehow this particular book had the power to bring down the lie. I, I, I'm wondering if that had something to do with the confidence that that regime, in the end, could not withstand what the Gulag represented. Yeah, there's a, an, an extraordinary passage, uh, right, this is handy that you have this, the very, very last words of this book that is coming out tonight uh, is a, is, is, gives a sense of that, let's see. Moment. Yeah, wh wh without g giving you all the uh, all kind of background, but this is uh, Elizaveta Varanyanska is 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 uh, is the subject here, and this was one of his invisible allies, uh, about whom this exhibit uh, that I'm looking forward so much to seeing in the library is 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 uh, about them, and one of them was Varanyanska, and she she was the keeper of one of two copies of the Gulag, secret. Of the, of, the, of the manuscript. And when they found, they found her out, they seized it, which caused the whole chain of events that he gave the signal for the other copy that was in the West to be published and then, and the rest is history. But she was uh, found uh, hanging in her apartment a few days later. And the official version was that she hanged herself and it's possible and until those, you know, I don't know if those archives will be ever re released or if they're just burned. 
but the point is he's talking about Lerenyansky and he's talking about the Gulag and there's just, you just read, it's just a few words. They went and, and how they slandered him with this book that came out in 1978 later and, and just everything crossed out his whole life uh, in an attempt in this propaganda book of Vezich. They went ahead and did all they could. By pan-Soviet decree, all copies of One Day in the Life of Vladimir Denisovich and Matryona's home were burned, I mean, literally burned, right? So too in disgust did they burn all my clothes in the furnaces of the fort of a prison. And then they belched out book after book as curses hurled toward me. But as they inexorably crept into Elizaveta Varanyanska's unshielded cranny to strangle her, so did Archipelago inescapably enter into their fortified chambers, their mansions, their committee rooms, a corpse without gloves, wearing makeshift camp footwear from tractor tires. And they panicked. And he goes on just to finish. As the saying goes, take your turn behind bars, take your welt and your scars, pay the price in prison for the truth, and now pay it again for Turncoat's falsehoods. This is the author of this slanderous book. It is a good thing that I have the chance to counter all their lies. How many victims of the, in other words, other victims of the Soviet secret police were out and out slandered during their lives and after their deaths without ever having the opportunity to clear their names? Will anyone be able to do it for them? The end, well, it's not the end, but it's the end of part one. Uh, <laughs> So yes, I think he had a sense that, 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 that this book, that he never barely claimed authorship of it so much that he feel it came from, from the, not to say written by a divine you know, hand, his, his hand, but you know, guided by, yeah. by, by something bigger than him. And of course, uh, sourced, as we say now, by those 227, or now it's, uh, it, that number has been amplified, but, but so, so uh, now, but those uh, doctors, witnesses those that, that when yeah. those prison doctors told your father in December 1952 when he had the cancerous tumor that he had three weeks to live and he miraculously survived, he really understood that to be a, he had a providential mission to tell the truth about the Jacks, the Zacks to, to um, yes. you know, that, uh, that um, you know, he had, and this was sometimes used against him, that he had a sense of mission, but he, but, uh, <laughs> But, uh, and his whole attitude, I think, toward death changed after that. The only thing he was worried about was not getting the truth out in his lifetime. You agree, you agree yes. with that? Yes, yes, not having time. Yes. To uncover it in the case of, well, in the case of both of those cathedrals. Yeah, yeah, In the case yeah. of, to document the Soviet, the truth of the Soviet time, but even more importantly, to uncover what came before to uncover the, the revolution and uh, from, the, from under the, 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 the cinder blocks uh, of, of suppression and lies and, and uh, 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 clouds that, 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 uh, in, in which it was covered, never to rise again, but it did. And so mm -hmm. did, would he have the time and the opportunity and, and he made it and I think that made him a, a deeply fulfilled uh, and, 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 and happy person just in terms of his, his mission. Yes. Absolutely. Well, that's a wonderful note to end on. Friends, we are out of time for the formal program. However, please join us in the atrium uh, for a reception celebrating the publication of Between Two Millstones. There are copies available for sale from, the Notre, from Notre Dame Press at a discounted conference rate, and Ignat has graciously agreed to sign copies of the book as well. So please enjoy and we'll continue our conversation in the atrium, but there's one person that I need to recognize that I didn't recognize before, and that is the founder of the Center for Ethics and Culture, David Solomon, who has joined us this evening and is the... So thank you all. Let's, let's adjourn to the atrium and we can continue our conversation and Ignat will sign your books that you purchase. <laughs> <laughs>